ski equipment before we go out and ski next time. The idea being, if we look at the equipment, I think we'll find out a little more of what it's about, why it's designed the way it is, and that will help you understand the equipment. We're going to start with skis. And I've written down on the board the basic four things that we need to worry about when we design equipment for skiing. And we're going to start by looking at the skis in terms of how they are designed so they maneuver on the snow. Now, any of you who've been out floundering around in the deep snow where you're stepping, you know, with just boots on, you know how you sink because all of your body weight's on a small surface, your foot. The idea is we'd like to stay on top of the snow. It's more fun, okay? So the way they do that is they spread your weight out over a big surface area. So instead of something small like your boot, we make a long ski, which spreads the surface of your weight over a large area and allows you then to stay on top of the snow. Same principle is true in snowshoeing, okay, where we have a sort of a large thing on our foot, which again spreads the weight out, okay? Second thing that we have in a ski that allows us to move on the snow is what we call a running groove. There's a small groove that runs all the way down the length of the bottom of the ski. Now what that's there for isn't just fancy design. You take a ski, and if we did not have a running groove on it, we just were skiing on a flat board, what would happen is my ski would tend to fish around sideways. Okay, as I'm skiing along, the ski could slide out sideways on me, which makes for more work. I'd always be pulling my skis in. Okay, if you put a running groove in the bottom of a ski, see this little groove there, when I'm skiing along, the snow is going to move into that to conform to that little groove, and I'm going to have something that runs underneath a little line of snow, which will allow me to stem the ski and keep it going in a forward line without it fishing around sideways on me. You'll never find a ski without this running groove. It's an essential part of the design, okay, because it helps me maneuver and enjoy my skiing a little more. Moving on snow, and that's called camber. It's spelled like that. Um, what camber is, is it's a curve of the ski. Now I'm going to exaggerate this drawing. It's hard to see on a cross-country ski because they're not very wide. It's much more visible on a downhill ski. But what we have, and I'm going to exaggerate the drawing, is we have tails and tips that are wider than the waist of the ski. What this allows to do, we have, this is called side camber. What this allows the ski to do is to carve a turn. So when I'm going down a hill, I can carve a turn some, and that is important. But like I say, it's not too visible on a cross-country ski. But it is there. One other kind of camber is the bottom camber, or the curve of the ski. Okay, it has, um, if you put this on a flat surface, you would see that it's up from the floor in the foot area. Okay, so there's two kinds of camber. Okay, that's the basic things that we have from a ski so we can move on the snow. Okay, second thing, ease of movement. Now, nobody likes to go out and work too hard. Okay, basically we're lazy. And if you had to, I mean, you want somewhat of a workout, you're doing this for exercise and for fun, but at the same time, you don't want to go out and have a torturous session. You want something that's enjoyable. So there are several things about a ski that allows that, okay? First one is what we call forward spring. A ski is much different than going out and skiing on a board. The ski is designed so that the tip of the ski, or the very top part, is very flexible. The waist area where you put your foot is rather stiff. And then the tails are stiff, but not quite as stiff as the waist. What happens is, as I push the ski down, it's going to, because this end is stiffer, it's going to sort of push the ski forward as the ski springs back up, because it is not evenly constructed. This end is stiff, this end is flexible. So the ski sort of has a tendency to jump forward, and that helps you move forward. It assists your movement, okay? Secondly, we're interested in traction. How many of you have downhill skied? Put your hand up if you've downhill skied. Okay, we have a few. Okay, in downhill skiing, we don't have to worry about that because we get a ride up the hill on a toe. 
okay, a chairlift, whatever. On cross-country skiing, though, we go up the hills. We also spend a lot of time on the flat, and if you don't have any way of getting some traction, this would be a real drag because you'd be slipping all the time. So we have to design skis so that we can get both glide and grip. Okay, now you may say, well, how can you get both? That's the mystery of this whole thing. Okay, there are two ways of doing this. One is to use wax. I'm going to give you an, an explanation of how wax works on another day, because there's no reason why you can't learn how to wax. It's very simple. However, we don't have the time in class to wax our skis, so we go with the waxless skis. And the lazier people go with waxless, usually. There are exceptions. There are some times when it's nice to have a waxless ski, but on the whole, the wax is still hard to beat. OK, what kind of waxless skis do we have? There are a couple kinds. This particular ski is called a negative bottom. What I have done, or what the ski makers have done, is they've taken a ski and they have gouged out some little steps in here. OK, if I run my hand from the, tail, the tip down to the tail, it's fairly smooth. That's the direction I go when I'm scooting down hills and things. So I'm going to glide OK. The idea here is when I run my hand this way, I'm catching all these edges. And it's much rougher. So I'm going to catch the snow against these edges. So when I go up the hill, the snow is going to get caught here. Or when I kick against the snow backwards, it's going to catch these edges. OK, so that's how this particular type works. We don't have this kind in class. We have another kind, and this is called mohair. We have two strips of synthetic mohair um, that are applied to the bottom of the ski. Now, if I run my hand, and here's the tip, I run it this direction, it's nice and smooth. And again, when I run my hand this way, I catch all those hairs up, and that's going to do the same thing. Again, it'll catch the snow when my ski is moving backwards or trying to slip backwards. Okay, so again, I'm getting some traction. Notice that the area that we put these on is right under the foot area. It goes up a little past and a little beyond, but it's basically the foot area. And I'll explain why that is in a few minutes. dribble to the sides that the defense man forces you to. When you get to that side, you're going to switch your hand so you can go the other way. Okay, first person in each line. Begin. Good job. Good job, good job. Okay, next person. Switch hands, switch hands, keep the ball away from you, away from that defensive man. Good job, that's it. Okay. Okay, coming back the other way. Try to keep the ball away from the defensive man. 
when you switch hands and when you're dribbling with your right hand, with your left hand, make sure your body is turned away from the defensive man. Okay, begin. Good job. That's it. Good dribbling, good defense. That was perfect if everybody saw that. That was perfect. Try to, try to pattern yourself like, like they're doing. Okay, go ahead. Keep the ball away from the defensive man. Keep your body in front of him. Okay, next. That's it, good job. Good defense, good offense. Okay. Next. Boundaries are the black line. That's it. Okay. I'm sure all of you have passed the chest pass. Move away. I'm sure all of you have passed this chest pass since you've been in grade school, right? How can we make that difficult? Running up and down. Great. That's, that's perfect. How else can we make it difficult? That's right. Have a def you said have a defensive person in there. That's correct, too. How else can we make it difficult? What? Right. Bouncing it when you're running. Okay, to start out with, to start out with, we're going to start out chest pass when you're running. I can guarantee you already the balls are going to go flying all over the place. So watch, be careful. Take your time, go at a speed that you're comfortable with. Okay? Get your partner out there, get about five feet apart. No, no traveling is allowed in this. Keep the ball going, keep the ball going. Just chest passes. Let's go. Good job. Good job. Both. Good job, guys. In our gymnastics unit, the student prepares two routines on the events of their choice. They can choose from the balance beam, the uneven parallel bars, vaulting, tumbling, still rings, pommel horse, juggling, dual tumbling, pyramids, or aerobics. Gymnastics work is excellent total body movement. It emphasizes and builds strength, coordination, balance, and self-confidence.
first day we practice backhand and forehand blocks. That's what generally you do with a spike when you defense it. Okay, also I still noticed a lot of you were hitting straight on. You're hitting straight on on your spikes. Try to go over the top, imply topspin. Imply topspin both your backhand and left hand. The reason why again, because the ball will tail and it will have a better chance of hitting the table. Right? Are there any questions on any of that? The only time that it may be good to go straight over the top if you're set up, if the ball is set up really high and it's right near the net. And you can quick reach over and just slam it down. And your person is playing you way back or he's out of play. You just want to get in a quick shot. Okay, now the next thing what we're going to do is when you come to class early, you have a little bit of time. So pick up a paddle and a table tennis ball. And now on, it's going to be open for you. Pick up a, the door will be. Pick up a paddle, table tennis ball, and you can practice a wall volley if you don't have a partner. And if the tables aren't out here, since this is an early class, get up to the wall and just work on a wall volley. Here's a wall volley for you. Just work on your forehand and backhand. Forehand and backhand. Okay, does everybody see that? Let's work on that. It's good for, it's good for hand-eye coordination. It's good for hand-eye coordination. Another one you can practice is just hit the ball and change your paddle. Turn it forward, backward. See how many you can do. This is when you're by yourself before class. Okay? Okay, also, and what we're going to have you practice is just tossing the ball up and putting a slam against the wall. Both backhand and forehand. Notice how I'm going over. I'm putting on topspin. Okay, now get with your partner, find an area on the wall, and practice these. We're going to be working on figures in roller skating. We do have competition in roller skating with figures, the same as we do with ice skating. We have figure, figure eights and different figures that we use. In order to do this, you have to understand a little bit about the skates that you're using. 
If you stand, everyone stands so that your weight is evenly distributed over your skates. Now I would like you to put the emphasis on the inside edges of your skates. So just move your ankles so that you've got all of your weight on the inside edges. Now put it on the outside edges. Now we're going to call the wheels the inside edge and the outside edge of our wheels. And we are going to emphasize one side or the other going forward. Now it is also possible when you become rather proficient at this to do it backwards. But we're only going to work on forwards, first of all. Now it's easiest to work on the inside edge of our skate because when we do that, we have the other skate ready to put down and catch us in the event that we're going to fall. You will all learn the T-stop position last time. And this is the position that we'll start in as we're trying to do our circle. Okay, Barb, would you come on out here? We're going to get Barb in the T position. She's going to be using her right skate, the inside edge of her right skate. She's going to attempt to go around the circle this way. In order to make it easier for you to do this, you turn your hips so that you're facing the inside of the circle. You lead with your skating arm. Your free arm is towards the inside of the circle. Now what you're going to do is just simply push off as we did last time, lean on the inside edge as you just demonstrated, and then go around the circle. Okay, Barb, try it. Push and around. Okay, everyone see how she does that. She has this other foot here so that she can set it down in the event that she needs to. Now, when she pushed, she was able to go about a quarter of the way around the circle until before she slowed down and had to start again. It might be that you have to push off and stop, push off and stop, okay, if you don't have your balance very good yet. However, some of you might be good enough so that you can push off and go halfway around or even further around the circle. We're going to practice now your inside right skate edge. So if you go to your circles, everybody will turn. Just get on the circle and stop. Spread around the circle, all the way around. Get in the T position with your right skate facing. Turn your hips so that your belly button or your stomach is towards the middle of the circle. Put your right arm forward, your left arm towards the middle of the circle. And then push off and practice around. Push off and practice. Don't lean too far forward. Keep your balance straight up and down. Keep your balance straight up and down.
Today what we are going to be working on will be the address position and the grip. The address position is extremely important because our object is to get the ball to fly directly to our target. And if we are lined up in such a way that we are not towards our target, then our ball has no chance of getting where we want it to go. So one of the first things that we have to do is determine our target line. We have the ball sitting on the mat and we have a target directly ahead of us. What we're going to do is to draw a line from the target directly through the ball. Then we're going to place our toes along a line that runs parallel to that target line. So that I now have my body facing towards the target, I have the face of the club facing towards the target. The rest of the address position is this. You have your toes shoulder width apart, your knees are slightly bent. You are in a fairly relaxed position. Now we have to bend somewhat in order to let the club reach the ground. So the bend comes from the hips, not from the waist. We don't want you to bend over like this and hunch over the ball. We're going to have you bend from the hips so that the ball is in a comfortable position ahead of us in this position. So this is our dress position. Now as we are swinging the club, okay, we're not going to be actually swinging the club quite yet. But we want to practice the swinging position. We are in our address position and we're going to swing back. As we're swinging back, we want our back to the target. The back is going to go towards the target. So we're in this position, we swing back towards the target. As we're doing this, the one thing that's very important is that you do not straighten or lock your right knee. So you're in this position, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. You want to keep your knees bent, you're here, and you swing back so that your back is to your target. Now, as you come through, as we're swinging through, we want our belly button to be towards the target. Belly button is towards the target. This will automatically have you move from your center position here, where your weight is evenly distributed, to a position where your weight is on your t back foot, to a position where your weight is on your target foot. Okay, as we're doing this, we're going to be holding on to the clubs in this manner today so that we can practice the swing without worrying about the grip, without worrying about the clubs. Good, good, good ball players can make that adjustment. You and I, and I'm putting that at you and I in a poor category, this is quite an adjustment. What I'm trying to say to you is, it's far better to start with that elbow down already, right in close to your side, and then you don't have any adjustment, because when you come through, that elbow is against that side. But should your pictures or analyze the person's swing, you don't see a person come through like this with the elbow up. You may start with it up, but it comes right down in here. And if you see any type of pictures of a person stop action hitting, when they're making contact with the ball, their elbow is right against their side. The bat's about this position. So I'm saying to you again, it's far better to start right here. Then you don't have hardly any adjustment at all. So I see so many people when they get out there and they're batting and they pop one up. Somebody will yell, get that elbow up, get that elbow up. Well, this doesn't do any good. Here's where that adjustment is, right here. So when you're batting, get that elbow down, come on through. Your arms extend and get out from the body, but your elbow is really against your side. Enough on batting, you know, they're going to change your batting techniques, but think about that. The big thing on pitching in now, which is the name of the game, can I have somebody that can catch pretty decent? 
and getting out of string. Could you go over and get me that glove and ball? Who can catch fairly good? Quickly, come on. Because there's, there's three aspects involved in pitching. Just get down there a little bit. There are three, get about right down there so I don't have the back too much. When you're getting at softball, there's three, three styles of pitching. Final act is pretty uh, known for moderate pitch. A lot of locales don't have moderate pitch. They don't know what it is. In fact, Final Act makes adjustments on moderate pitch to suit the city needs. But basically, there are three styles of pitch. Slow pitch, moderate pitch. I shouldn't say fast pitch. Most people say fast pitch. Another name for fast pitch would be what? Unlimited, unlimited. Now, I'm gonna go through your three styles of pitching and try and demonstrate. Pitching in softball is very easy, yet there are very few people that can pitch effectively or pitch fast. Fast pitch, I see just an article in a paper the other day from Sturgeon Bay. They had about 28 fast pitch teams in Sturgeon Bay. Now they're down to 16. It's a community of about 8,000. They're complaining about how it's dwindling. Final act, a few years back, we're up 16, 18, 20 teams. They have zero fast pitch teams, nothing. Everything is slow pitch and moderate pitch. Why? In order to have fast pitch or unlimited speed pitch, you've got to have pitchers. And there aren't any pitchers. But it's a tremendous gain. There's a big difference in it. Slow pitch now. We'll start from the, the slow. We'll go to the moderate. Then we'll go to the fast. Slow pitch and moderate pitch are very similar. The pitch and slow pitch now requires a pitch, if I remember right, just looked up in the rules, an arc. The biggest thing on a pitch is an arc. An arc from six feet to 12 feet in height. Anything over or under that is automatic ball. Too much something like that, anything lower than that. Your moderate pitch requires an arc from one to three feet. And what is one to three feet? It's an arc approximately like that, okay? Anything less than that or greater than that is an automatic ball. Now this is what we're gonna be involved in moderate pitch speed out there. We'll get into the rules and regulations on who's gonna be pitching and so forth. The moderate pitch requires a mo an arc of one, three foot. Good toss. Now, the big thing I wanna demonstrate quickly is unlimited speed. Last year, some of you were on, you should have had the opportunity to see probably one of the best pitchers there been for years, and that's Eddie Fainer, who refers to himself as the king of his court. I believe he's in about 60 years of age right now and still throwing that ball 90 some miles an hour, which is fast. And the thing that amazes me is this, and I always say, you, you, I hear Lad now from the Brewers, he's supposed to have a fastball around 90 miles an hour, one of the fastest, 90 miles an hour, whew, that is fast. Softball players throw them well over 100 miles an hour, and yet people aren't too amazed at it. Another thing, baseball pitchers pitch from a 60 foot distance, 90 miles an hour, a lot of time to react. Fast pitch, 45 distance, over 100 miles an hour. The thing about softball pitching, there isn't any strain on the arm. Baseball players, fingers, he's got a bad arm, and Vukovic got a torn rotator cup, and these guys, after they throw their arm is in ice, and they got to rest five, six, seven days. In softball pitching or underhand pitching, there isn't any strain on the arm. That's why you can go forever in softball pitching. Now, it's just a very, very easy pendulum swing, and I can't for the life of me imagine why more people cannot get into the art of softball pitching. A nice, easy pendulum swing, and yet the ball seems to you know, jump right out of your hands. Now, what I'm demonstrating now is what is called a fast pitch. There's two styles, a windmill style, a slingshot style. Before I do that, would this be a fast pitch? pitch. Would I pitch like that in fast pitch softball? Why not? What's wrong with this? Illegal pitch? No. Hey, you could use that as a changeup. Why I say fast pitch, fast, fast pitch softball doesn't have to be as pitching as fast as you can. If I wanted to throw fast pitch softball like that, I could. Nothing illegal about it. 
What you try and do, of course, is get as much speed as possible. I'm going to be hand, hand, handicapped a little with this cord here. I'm going to try and do it as possible, best as I can. I'm going to start off with a slingshot. This is referred to as a slingshot. Oh, well, just watch the speed generated on just a nice, easy throw. There isn't any strain on the arm at all. It's taking a lot of time before we get going, but I do want to get this across because not too many people in Fond du Lac uh, experience fast pitch softball. school year, our students have the opportunity of selecting for more than 25 different activities. New electives can be chosen at the end of each six weeks. The physical education staff at Goodrich enjoyed making this program available to you.